Hello and welcome to a new Hello World tutorial. This is a tutorial series aimed at beginner beginners. So uh, we're going to look at some more basic, basic stuff today. And today's subject is classes, which we all should be familiar with, but I know from my own experience and from speaking to a lot of other people that they very rarely get used to their full potential, especially by Unity developers who are learning through videos like this. So I'm just going to go through, we're not, we're not going to cover every possible thing you could do with classes, but we're going to go through some of the things that I found most useful. We'll make ourselves a little script to start with. I mean, the first thing that people who are new to Unity should probably get their head around is actually using classes in the first place, never mind using them to their full potential. So when you create a new script like we just did then, what you're essentially doing is creating, well, what you are doing is creating a class. In this case, the class is classes. What this is, is kind of like a function. It will be a one way of thinking it. So you've got your start function, your update function, you can create other functions as well. And then at the top here, you can declare variables, and that's a, that's a class. In the way that everything in C-sharp is sort of a hierarchy, anything that's declared in this class can be used anywhere else in this class below it. So update and start can both access some integer. If you wanted to update, could call start. If you had something, say, in here, in this function, you declared an integer in here, you wouldn't be able to call this integer from in this function. And that's basically how things work throughout. So if you declare something in this class, then you wouldn't be able to use this value from another class. You would have to have a reference to that value. So let's create our first, well, actually, for, before we get into that, let's just discuss this. So this mono behavior, mono behavior here is the type that this inherits from. So what this basically means is that everything in mono behavior is accessible in here. We could create a new class. So let's say public class, we'll just call it parent class. And we will make this derive from mono behavior. And then all we're gonna put in here is we're gonna declare that public int some integer. Now, if we go down here and we're in, in start, we try and use some integer. We say some integer equals 12, it's showing up as an error because we haven't declared it. However, if we change this to parent class, that error has gone away because it's derived from this class, which means we now have access to this integer. And because this class is derived from mono behavior, we have access to all the mono behavior scripts as well. So the start and update and everything else that comes along with that. But that's fairly basic stuff. What I wanted to really get into is making our own classes and, and really getting into the nitty and gritty of that. So let's create our first class. We're just gonna call it my class. And then we're going to go through some of the things that you can do to, to really make use of, of your own classes. So the first thing you should be aware of is if you want to access your class in the inspector in Unity, you need this system.serializable. So if we put in here, we'll declare two random values, public string, we'll just call it name, and then a public int amount. Obviously these are completely meaningless and arbitrary. It's just something to look at in the script. We'll get rid of all this. And then here we will have a public my class. We'll just call it my class. Now if we go back into Unity, I create an empty object, which we're just gonna call my class. And then we drag our classes script onto here. We'll see that we now have a my class variable. And if we drop it down, we've got access to our name and amount value. Whereas if we didn't have this, we wouldn't be able to access it in the inspector. It needs to be serializable. And you can see we've got our some integer from our inherited class up there showing up because it's public. So in order to mess around with your own class in the inspector, you need to have this this system.serializable. So that's that's the first thing. The next thing is constructors. So when you initialize a class, so right now we've just made this public, so it's essentially initialized in here. Now that's all fine and dandy for public classes, but what if it's not a public class? So let's just remove this. And what we'll do instead is in our start function, we will do my class MC equals new my class. And then we're gonna debug dot log string dot format name and amount. And then to get the values for those, simply 
my class dot name my class dot amount so now we can't see it in here any longer but if we run it we should get a debug in here which is telling us the name and the amount although we haven't set a name and amount so we're getting nothing and nothing so let's set our values now ordinarily you would do it like this And then when you run it, this time we should have a value. So it's some name and amount 12. So I'll just put a colon there. That's gonna bug me otherwise. So that's fine, but this is three lines of code and we shouldn't need to use three lines of code to initialize a new value with its variables already in place. So the way we can do that is we can do a constructor. So a constructor is basically a block of code to tell Unity what to do with your class when it is initialized. You set up a constructor by doing inside your class public, my class and then basically just that and then anything that happens in here will be done when when this happens so that's that's fine however what if we want to pass the values in if we just let's let's choose vector 3 when you do a new vector 3 for example uh, I'm gonna have to type out the full thing here a3 equals new vector 3 so when you do it a, a a new class of type of any type and there's more than one const uh, more than one way you can initialize it so here we've got one of three we can do it just as it is without giving it any values we can give it an x and a y or we can give it an x and a y and a z those are the different options when you get that what that actually is is multiple constructors here so this is one constructor what do we do if it is initialized and there's nothing called like this well what we can do there is name equals default amount equals one but one isn't in quotation marks because that's an in integer so then if we comment this out and then we run it we're not setting those values so it will default to the values that we've just given it in the constructor default and amount one so that's one possible constructor however we can override that with another one public my class and in this one we can just give it a name so we'll say string, we'll give it a different, we'll just say underscore name. It doesn't really matter what you call it, it just needs to be something that makes sense, I guess. And then in here, we'll do pretty much the same thing, but this time name will equal underscore name. And then we'll say amount equals one. So if we go back up to here, this time, you'll see we've got options. We can just declare it as we did before, or we can give it a name when we declare it. So let's give it a name. And then if we run it this time, we have declared name. So that's two options for our constructor. And then obviously, I don't need to carry on going over and over this. You could do another one. And this one would have name and amount. And then if we declared that that way, because we now have this option as well, you would just simply give it an amount. And then when we run it, we get our declared name and our declared amount. So they're your constructors, and you can envision any number of possibilities for what you might want to do in your constructor. So for example, we might say we have an array of ints, int array of ints, and we don't initialize it. What we could have is in our constructor, we could add an integer, we'll just call it size, and then when we declared it, we could initialize our array with that size. So array of ints equals new int size. It's not limited to just passing in these values that you need here. You can also pass in data that helps the class understand what it's about to do. So let's look at another one and that is functions. Functions you should be fairly familiar with. They work pretty much the same way they do anywhere else. Any functions you wish to use from outside, you need to be public. So if, if you made a private function or, or you just typed void you wouldn't be able to get at it from in here so if i just do void some function and then i wanted to call it from in here mc dot see it's not showing up so it has to be public and now that should go away because i do need to use all the same syntax so then in our some function what we could do here is we could 
drag our debug dot log line down here and then obviously we're no longer calling from outside of the class so we don't need this reference here this MC so just delete those two and now we directly access in the name and the amount from within the class and then we're calling it here just uh, I'll just delete that array thing so we don't get an error and then when we run it we get the exact same result but now it's being called using this some function and you could have the function to do anything the function could be to return if we had that array the function could be to return a list of all the array items it could be to return like if you had an array of ints it could be to add up the total of those ints and give you the total amount or the average or something like that you could do whatever you want with these functions let's just to, to better visualize what we're doing here let's recreate a familiar class a little bit so we'll get rid of all of this and we're gonna not fully but we're gonna recreate a vector 3 Obviously we can't call it vector3 because we're in Unity and that is an existing class so it will cause problems. So we're going to call it v3 and then in here we're going to make a new public v3 v3. So down here we have public float x, public float y, public float Z. So that's what you have in a vector three. So if we were to do vector three v equals new vector three, you got your float x y z. That's all this is here. So let's build some constructors. Public v three. We're taking none, and all we're going to say is x equals not f y equals not f and z equals not f. And we'll do public v3 float x float y float z and then in this one we're just exactly the same thing except this time we're giving it some values to start with so then if we went up here and we wanted to create a new one of these we could just say v3 v equals new v3 and then we can give it some values, float x, float y, float z. So we'll just say 12, 3, 6. So essentially exactly the same as a vector 3. This, this actually could do a bit of a function, so let's just put that in. And start. So now that we've got our constructors for this, one thing let's let's recreate a couple of the um, a couple of the functions that vector three have. One of them is vector three dot zero. So obviously that won't do anything because it's not part of an equation, but that returns this basically. So all we're going to do here is we'll create a public v three, which we're going to call zero. It doesn't take in any parameters. And it's just going to return a new v3 and that's it and that will return three zeros because when we initialize a new v3 like this the values are all zero so if we just stick down here debug.log string.format and then zero one two So if we run that now, we should get those three values that we set. Yeah. But if we change the value of this to say v equals v3.0. Oh, sorry. Um, this needs to be a static class. We could have initialized as this, but, you know, we've initialized it with numbers, but now we want it to be zero. We can say equals v3.0, and then we'll press play. And we have zero. So another one that they do that is in vector three is one. So we're gonna do we're just gonna copy this, we're gonna change the name of the function to one, and then this time we're gonna say one f, one f, one f. And then we press play, and we're getting a load of ones. Oh, oh another thing that probably be worth doing here is instead of having this, because uh, you don't want to have to put brackets when there's no situation where you would be passing parameters to these functions, get rid of them and then replace it with a get. And again, there's no set needed because we're never going to be setting anything. This is this is specifically exist to get a a certain value, which we always know where it's going to be. 
And you could carry on with this and you can add an up, which would be obviously zero, one, zero, and a forward, which would be zero, zero, one, and a right, which would be one, zero, zero. You get the idea. So another thing you might want to do with this, which will come in handy. And again, remember you can, you can set up any functions like this. You can set up any constructors. You can have it run any code you want in those constructors. Same for this. One other thing that you might want to do is public static v3 operator plus and then you want to take in we'll say a uh, v3 a v3 b and in here would say v3 we'll just call it lowercase v3 equals new v3 and we're not putting any values in it yet we're about to set those values and then you would say v3 dot x equals a dot x plus b dot x and then you basically just copy those a dot y b dot y a dot z b dot z and then you would return v3 so if we create up here we'll create a second v3 which we're going to call v2 equals new not actually equals v3 dot one so we'll call this v1 and then we'll say v3 v equals v1 plus v2 so now we should get because we're adding a fake vector 3 1 to this initialized one we should get the result of 13 4 and 7 or not uh what have i done there oh right yeah sorry <laughs> Of course, you have to actually set all the values correctly. So let's try that again. 13, 4, and 7. And then, obviously, you can do the same for minus. You can do the same for divide, multiply. And there's all sorts of other functions you can do. You can do a square root, for example. You could do a normalize function, which would be a very handy one if you were creating something like this. So, I mean, I think I've covered quite a few of the more important things that you can do. It's worth noting, you can't have a constructor on a class that derives from mono behavior. Another very useful class related thing to know is, and I'll, I'll do a separate video on this, I think at some point, but in addition to mono behavior and all the other ones, there's uh, editor scripts and things like that, scriptable object is a very useful one to have. Like I say, I'll do I'll do a video on that later, but scriptable object is just scriptable object. And then what you can do with that is if I go, to, if I change this to create asset menu, and then in here I put uh, menu name equals my object forward slash v3 and then we went back in here it should have a new menu item my object and then we can create a v3 which right now doesn't do anything we'll leave it called new v3 but you can see that our values are there and it's, it's coming up with some errors right now because I did not code this script to be a scriptable object. I'm just showing you it. But what you can do is you could have, say, a settings object, for example, or a, if you were storing data for how a player looks, like you were storing the hair color and the clothes they were wearing or something, you could have all those variables stored in a scriptable object. And then you could just create as many, script, uh, many of these scriptable objects as you wanted. And then you could have them for different player configurations. And then instead of having to set them all at runtime or create them all, all over and over again you could just have a reference to the scriptable object in your script and you would just drag in the one that you wanted so like i say i'll probably do a, a separate video on that one let's just get rid of those so i think that's everything i wanted to go over in this like i say this hasn't even come close to scratching the surface of all the things that you can do with custom classes but hopefully this is enough to get you going at a beginner level if you let me know in the comments what you would like me to go over in the next hello world tutorial bearing in mind that it is intended to be this basic level so don't be asking for anything particularly complicated and uh, that will be it so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time bye bye